Good morning and hello to everyone joining at home from their workplaces or their home office, wherever you are today. Uh, welcome to this How to Unlock the Renovation Wave webinar, which today is organized by Positive Money Europe and Renovate Europe. Uh, today, this event is uh, basically commemorating the launch of the Unlock campaign by Positive Money Europe. Uh, please stick around to hear more details about that because this is a potentially very important and impactful uh, campaign that is today launching. Uh, basically, today's event is going to focus on how the banking sector in particular uh, can help catalyze a mass renovation of Europe's building stock, which I think by now we all realize uh, is an absolute must if we are to meet our climate targets here in Europe and across the world in general, of course. Uh, buildings, as probably many of you have heard this statistic ad nauseum by now, but it bears repeating because it is still quite shocking, I feel. Uh, buildings account for more than 36% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, unfortunately, annual renovation rates still barely scrape above 1%. Uh, this has to change. Uh, that is why the European Commission launched its Renovation Wave initiative uh, quite some months ago now, uh, aiming to at least double renovation rates uh, and upgrade 35 million buildings all by 2030. A huge task, but as I just said, very necessary. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch, of course, unfortunately, uh, and the Commission estimates a funding gap of around 275 billion euros uh, per year. Uh, public money can only stretch so far. There's basically either not enough of it or it takes too long to uh, get where it's needed. Uh, so this is where bank lending can take up some of the slack, at least. But what needs to be done to change the system? Are regulators already working on this? Uh, what role should the European Central Bank be playing as well? Uh, to help answer all those questions, we have assembled some very, very knowledgeable speakers who will be able to speak and talk us through uh, this issue at length. Uh, in the first half of today's event, we'll hear three presentations on the current state of renovations and what the EU and the ECB uh, can do to improve matters. Uh, we'll then hear from a second panel of experts and have a Q&A towards the end of the event, uh, which you in the audience are wholeheartedly uh, encouraged to participate in. There is a Q&A function on Zoom. We've been doing this for two years now, so I trust that all of you are able to, uh, um, to navigate that quite easily. Uh, please ask your question to uh, whoever you want to ask and we'll get to them when we can. Uh, so our first panel of speakers, first up we have Adrian Joyce, uh, he is campaign director of Renovate Europe and he will be talking us through the current state of play of the renovation challenge. After him we'll have Peter Sweetman, he's CEO and founder of Climate Strategy who is going to talk us all through the EU renovation loan, what that is and what it can do to help for this issue that we're talking about today. And then we have Uri Batsaikan uh, from Positive Money Europe, who is gonna talk us through how the ECB can finance home renovations through its finance operations, and in particular through its targeted long-term refinancing operations. Um, before I hand over to Adrian, uh, we'll also have Sean Kelly from the European Parliament, Carlos Goldstein from the European Commission, and Jennifer Johnson from the European Mortgage Federation, who I will introduce in more detail after our first three speakers. So enough from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Adrian first for his 10-minute uh, presentation. Adrian, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, and good morning to all of the audience, or good afternoon if you're elsewhere in the world. Yes, it's a great pleasure for Renovate Europe to uh, co-organize this event uh, to talk about financing the renovation wave um, and how to unlock it, because it hasn't yet been unlocked, although it was launched by the Commission in October 2019. I think it's always worthwhile recalling the context, the difficult context in which we live uh, at the present time. <clears throat> and I don't need to tell this audience that uh, last year was exceptional in terms of climate events and that now the tragic crisis of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is really focusing minds and uh, the energy sector has been particularly affected. Sam already told you that the challenge we face is enormous because of the number of buildings we have in the EU uh, and their very, high, um, their very high energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. However, they, they're behind the building sector is a huge construction uh, ecosystem, which has a very uh, powerful influence on our economic viability uh, across the EU great job creator, and uh, but it is highly fragmented. So there's a big challenge in terms of that structure of the construction sector when we come to upscaling uh, renovation. And the buildings in Europe are not in very good uh, condition in terms of energy performance. Uh, in 2018, the BPIE found that only 3% of our buildings have an A-level uh, rating, meaning that 
97% of the buildings need some attention to give them the kind of performance uh, we know is needed to address those uh, climatic and other energy crises that we face. In 2020, sorry, 2019, the European Commission uh, released a major study on uh, renovation activities within buildings. And that study found that for deep renovation, defined as a minimum of 60% savings uh, per project, we're only operating at a rate of 0.24% per annum across the building sector. And it is that rate that needs to be increased significantly because it's deep renovation that counts uh, when we want to really have an impact on long-term goals. But the European Commission has not been idle uh, nor have the other institutions. And here's a, just a selection of the various announcements, strategies, uh, and directives that are uh, addressing these issues uh, in the EU. And they go right back uh, to that uh, European Green Deal with its renovation wave strategy back in October 2019, through the Next Generation EU initiative, helping us to deal with the um, uh, COVID crisis and the need for recovery and resilience across Europe, into the uh, Fit for 55 package containing uh, 11 uh, legislative proposals where we're now really focused in terms of the energy efficiency directive and importantly for us, the energy performance of buildings directive. So a challenging legislative landscape against a challenging technical landscape uh, is kind of the picture I uh, want, wanted to build this morning. And turning more specifically to the Repower EU uh, action plan, which is anticipated for next week, uh, we believe that this can be a powerful tool to help to uh, continue the focus on energy performance of buildings and to really help uh, get wean us off uh, imported energy, something that Renovate Europe had already highlighted in 2015 uh, with a video on energy security. But we understand that the uh, action plan will be built on three pillars, one diversifying energy supplies, boosting renewable energy supply and the renewable energy sector here in the EU, and bringing energy efficiency actions forward. And it seems to us that there's not enough um, focus in the uh, preparatory phase on energy efficiency actions. Maybe something we can pick up in the discussion, Sam. But the big question would be, how will this be funded? Uh, are we going to see some repackaging of existing funds? Is there going to be some kind of boost to the existing recovery and resilience funds? Are the commission considering new funding? Uh, at this point, we're in the dark. But there are great opportunities uh, in the Repower EU action plan. It's been like a wake up call. Um, because reducing energy demand and reducing the amount of energy we use is the sustainable approach for energy security, for environmental uh, benefits, for reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And there, the use of energy renovation as a tool is a key measure. But when we uh, undertake that work, we want to ensure quality at all stages. So for me, the main challenge is the word mobilization. There's a need to mobilize across many, many levels. Technical and project su development support is needed. At, and from the EU level, we have instruments uh, in several uh, departments. But that needs to flow quickly down to national and crucially local level. So through one-stop shops to energy agencies into the municipalities of Europe where the real work takes place. But the whole value chain of the, of the construction sector itself needs to pay attention and get mobilized. And we think that can be done through digitalization and industrialization of renovation. We think we can recruit new talent, young talent, and we can also upskill the existing uh, workforce. Beyond that, the national governments themselves will need to do more on implementing their long-term renovation strategies and make them more operational. Uh, they, we hope, will pull forward the actions they've already promised to within the recovery and resilience plans. Uh, and maybe one key issue also in the building sector is permitting. How can you get planning permission or environmental approvals for large-scale uh, renovation projects? And the national governments in my view, need to engage more meaningfully with the stakeholder community. 
And it would be useful if we can find a way to motivate building owners uh, to wish for more energy renovation. Uh, we will uh, see the introduction of minimum energy performance standards, so an obligation on building owners. But we try within the Renovate campaign to demonstrate to building owners that the value of undertaking this work for them is higher than uh, waiting for it to be an imposition on them. And I just thought I would share with you a quick infographic that we produced on funding. Um, this is the public funding that's available across the current period 2021 to 2027. It's around 1.85 uh, trillion euro in several different packages. And in theory, 30% or 33% of all this money could, is meant to go to climate-related actions, and all of it could, in theory, go to um, building renovation. But 33% is only 610 billion, and as Sam said at the start of our uh, event, the estimate is we need uh, 275 billion per year, and we're talking about here a, a six-year period, so it's still if all of it went to buildings, it would still fall short. Sam, I think I might stop here, but for the audience, uh, I had included a couple of best practices uh, to just demonstrate that what we're talking about in the Renovate Europe campaign is not pie in the sky, it's happening. And it has been happening for years across the EU with very significant work across the different countries. You see 74% less energy after the works, 76% in Croatia. So when the slides are shared, the audience can uh, take a little time to go through those. So I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Happy to take uh, some questions if there are any flowing in. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm keen to uh, hear from the other two before we get to the Q&A, but I think we'll have more time then. So hopefully you will all stick around for that. Um, let's move on to uh, Peter now, Peter from Climate Strategy. Uh, your 10 minutes for your uh, take on uh, this issue that we are talking about today, Peter, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sam. And thank you uh, to um, everyone for, for inviting me to, to share some ideas here on how, and I'll use uh, Adrian's words, how to mobilize finance. Um, as Adrian has said, and as you've described, there are, we need to get to 35 million positive decisions on renovation in order to deliver the EU's renovation wave. Um, and of course, that goes far beyond public uh, sources of finance. And we're looking for two to three trillion euros worth of renovation money. So I thought what I'd talk to you about today was an idea which I think can deliver that. So um, of course, gas consumption is part of the uh, strategic uh, goals of uh, Europe now uh, to reduce it, of course. And, and, and um, it is uh, largely a buildings, so gas consumption is largely a buildings um, phenomenon. So with that in mind, um, the renovation wave, um, whose targets are 35 million uh, deep renovations by 2030, will require um, that trillion euros and, of course, will require something like a 10 times increase in the number of deep renovations that are currently occurring. So in that context, what is this EU renovation loan that um, we've been developing for the last few years? Well. Um, it's basically it's an EU backed instrument which can be distributed by um, regular uh, banking lenders that has a 30 year term, um, but a zero coupon structure. So a zero coupon structure just means that instead of paying interest every year or every month, um, the interest is paid at the end. Um, and that is an important feature, I think, or we think, for affordability considerations, um, for um, uh, any comparisons or calculations for pay as you save, where essentially um, because the interest rate will be paid at the end, um, and that, of course, is, is offset against the value of the property and the increasing value that happens over time, uh, that will allow um, many more homeowners to borrow the amount that they need to transfer their transform their homes. Um, and of course, it will increase the affordability, particularly for um, 
vulnerable communities. So uh, we talk a lot in uh, European terms about the energy poor. Now, of course, um, uh, grants and the 610 uh, billion euros, which um, Adrian has mentioned, I think work, work perfectly for those who are, who are generally the poorest end of society. But there are many, many people for whom uh, affordability is an issue who are not the absolute poorest, but we could consider them to be vulnerable communities in the just able to pay segment. Those might include elderly people on a reduced pension uh, for, who will not be able to get a mortgage anymore because they're too old, um, or young, young couples with no savings per se and very tight income um, a situation which will not allow them to pay additional interest and whom already have a mortgage. These, these um, people may own a property because the vast majority of people live in a property that they own. So they may not be considered uh, to be eligible for grants, but may still wish uh, to have the benefits of a deep renovation. And so therefore, he, the uh, European renovation loan fits that gap what, because these uh, particular classes of people are currently unbankable for tr more traditional loans. So the key mathematics behind this is that the European residential buildings today housing our 222 million homeowner, homeowner families are uh, worth around 17 trillion. There's just 7 trillion of mortgages outstanding in Europe, which leaves 10 trillion of home equity against which the owners can borrow to, for these deep renovations. So of course, 10 trillion, much more than the 1 trillion that we need, and hence this idea of unlocking the power of green equity through the EU renovation loan is quite important. Um, we, we, we note that this has to be a public-private instrument because the interest rates have to be what I call super low. So super low might be 1%, but of course, the EU borrowing, which is the borrowing which backs the recovery uh, funds, for example, indeed can be achieved at around 1% for 30 years. So if you did borrow 20,000 as an elderly couple or as a young family against your home and the rate was set at 1%, then the interest would roll up and you'd have to pay 27,000 uh, net of distribution fees after 30 years. In other words, an amount that's quite affordable given that over those 30 years, both the green value accreted to your property due to its efficiency and the overall inflation that would have occurred to the property itself would, we believe, make that affordable. Um, the interesting thing with respect of um, uh, the EU guarantee is because this uh, EU renovation loan is essentially lent against the property, so rather than against the borrower, it's against the property, um, and it is established at EU borrowing costs, um, that would allow these previously unbankable families, in inverted commas, to access things that look like mortgages to top up or work alongside other commercial products that they may have. Um, for, for banks, who would be the primary distribution channels or lenders, uh, or indeed uh, for any, any, any member of the financial su supply chain who has retail customers, um, there would be no cash interest payments. And so therefore, um, that makes the uh, operational side of, of worrying about an, an ERL uh, much, much simpler and therefore lower cost. And of course, all the cash savings that those customers wouldn't be paying to energy bills could indeed improve their credit worthiness with respect to other financial undertakings that they may already have with those banks, such as mortgages, and potentially would allow those mortgages to be set against now significantly more energy efficient properties and therefore uh, um, be green mortgages. So uh, finally, um, we talked about the junior lien that is just allowing central banks and, and others to look at these junior liens against that 10 trillion euros of equity and say that these are relatively low risk um, uh, 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 form of loans, given all of the benefits that would happen to the credit worthiness of the underlying and the delivery of the Paris Agreement and the climate and energy targets of Europe. So. Um, we think that um, the, RE, the, the REPAR EU action plan, the energy savings plan, could indeed offer member states the opportunity to repurpose some of the undrawn uh, recovery and resilience loans, which are, uh, which are I think, repurposable into an, an EU renovation loan. Uh, there seem to be no banks that we could find 
offering zero coupon low cost deep renovation loan products currently. Um, uh, there are many different types of products, but not this. Um, we think that the ERL can, insert, can certainly guarantee homeowners cash savings immediately because with a zero coupon structure, any cash you get from energy savings straight to your bottom line, essentially. The junior status and the EU guarantee would make it accessible to all homeowners who just demonstrate that their home is not in negative equity. And at the EU borrowing rates, the rolled up interest cost is likely to be lower than the house price, price inflation would be for the next uh, 30 years. Retail banks could be engaged to green their uh, um, existing mortgage portfolios through um, through being uh, par partners in the distribution of an, of an EU renovation loan. Um, and, and, and that really sort of brings me to the end of this uh, discussion. And I'll sort of stop there, but I'm happy to answer questions on that uh, concept. Fantastic. Thank you for explaining that, Peter. Um, I believe that everyone's PowerPoints will be available afterwards because there are already some people asking whether or not they will be uh, available to see after. Um, I encourage everyone to keep their questions coming in. We have some already. Uh, we'll keep going to uh, Uri next though, Uri Batsaikan uh, from uh, Positive Money Europe, who is going to talk us all through how the ECB can finance home renovations uh, through its financing operations. A reminder to everyone, we'll be back to Q&A later where we will really get into these details. Uh, Uri. Over to you for your 10 minutes. Yes, thank you for, for everyone. And thanks, Peter and, and Adrian, for, uh, for your presentations. Um, today, I would like to talk about how to unlock the renovation wave using the ECB's uh, risk refinancing operations. So I don't need to kind of tell you because Adrian and Peter already covered the, the, the great need to, to do energy uh, efficiency renovations across, across Europe. And the need is even more highlighted by the fact that uh, two thirds of EU gas consumption is industrial use and, and home heating. And why is that an even uh, bigger issue now? And why should the ECB care about this? Is that um, the, the latest uh, inflation numbers uh, for, for March show that inflation is 7.4% uh, uh, way above the kind of 2% target and half of it is due to, to, to imported uh, energy uh, inflation, so fossil inflation. Uh, and so reducing the uh, kind of EU's reliance on imported fossil fuels uh, will contribute to, in fact, uh, ECB meeting its inflation, uh, inflation uh, price stability mandate. So um, ECB definitely has, has, a, has a stake in it, and it's even more amplified in the situation that we have today. Um, the financing needs uh, that is uh, communicated by various numbers and research is somewhere between 150 to 275 billion uh, per year uh, additional investment needed to kind of to reach this gargantuan uh, goal of um, uh, by, by 2050 and 2030 uh, as per a renovation wave. Um, this is a very uh, tough graph it shows that most households finance renovations from their own savings uh, so uh, what this means is that uh, consumers wait until they have sufficient savings uh, to finance uh, energy efficient renovations and when they do uh, they do go for uh, for for light renovations and um, I would show later why why this is is a, is a, is a very big challenge. ACB has its own estimates. Uh, they say uh, the research done in 2019 that um, investment gap, uh, average investment gap per year is 224 billion. And uh, the gap funded by, by loans is 214 billion uh, that is needed uh, to, to finance renovations only through, through loans. Uh, why is the renovation so slow uh, through the bank lending channel is uh, can be broken down into cost and the complexity issue, both for the clients and for the banks. Uh, for the clients, um, it's the high cost of credit, uh, the not eligibility for, for collateral, short maturity, uh, lack of income because they finance uh, renovation through savings and the renovations might not be the, the priority for the households, especially given the fact that we've experienced two years of the pandemic and some households just they have very, very different consumption priorities. Uh, cost of energy assessments uh, and upfront costs are quite high. Um, and the lack of kind of technical knowledge and not to say the, the 
the kind of discomfort that one has to face during the renovation process. So this lets uh, people uh, put off the decision to renovate. And for banks, it's a low profitability of these loans uh, because they're small in size compared to like say mortgage loans, which are big. Um, and uh, the absence of, of collateral because these are not securitized loans. If it's coming from the consumer loan portfolio, um, it's, uh, it's, it's consumer loans, uh, lack of expertise in energy renovations of loan experts, certification, auditing, and uh, costs associated with uh, uh, training loan officers. And this all makes the banks uh, kind of uh, disincentivizes the banks to reach out to, to clients for, for smaller loans. It's, um, it's a, it's a big challenge, but it's also a big opportunity given the fact that um, banks are, are the kind of first line of, of operation when they when they talk to clients and they're also a decentralized network. And if given, uh, if given enough, enough incentives and the, and the lower costs, bank could be a great opportunity for, uh, for scaling up energy efficiency loans. So um, we conducted uh, a study uh, because of uh, uh, because there is a lack of uh, of data on bank financing data on energy efficiency renovations. Uh, we reached out to bank with our uh, survey. Um, and we have 14 banks. Um, I cannot disclose the names of the banks, but as you can see, uh, the interest rates on the consumer loan portfolio versus the mortgage portfolio is quite different. Uh, it's uh, because of its non-securitized nature, the interest rates on the consumer loan portfolio is much higher than the mortgage portfolio. Um, and uh, banks uh, report average pay payback periods. And as you can see, average loan value is, is quite different. But when we look at the monthly payments, they, they would have to pay uh, in taking out this um, loans or consumer loans is, uh, is, is quite high. Um, and this is the, is the numbers excluding the interest rate that they have to pay on loans. There is some um, empirical studies on, for example, on, on, on the Dutch, uh, housing sector that the, the renovation loan um, does not kind of pay off by the savings accrued by, by investing in energy efficiency renovation. So there is definitely uh, a market failure in that regard and that needs to, uh, that needs to be uh, changed. So what are the ECB's uh, Teltros? They're basically refinancing operations. These are the kind of lending operations that the central bank uh, performs with, uh, with the commercial banks in, in the euro area. Uh, there has been three Teltro operations and very much starting from Teltro 2 until, uh, until the end of uh, last year, uh, or around three trillion uh, were allocated for to to banks, and 2.2 is only since March 2020, so since the pandemic. Uh, banks borrow at negative rates, minus 0 0.5, and if they if the banks can demonstrate a certain lending threshold, so a constant lending, then they could borrow as as low rate as uh, negative one percent. So this is. Uh, in other words, uh, banks are, are borrowing and being paid to, to borrow. Um, and unfortunately, um, there is no climate and environmental conditions to attach to the, to the Teltros, and this needs to change immediately if we're going to tackle the, um, the, the, the challenges we, we have now. So we need uh, the green, green Teltros, green refinancing operations. How would the green Teltros work? Is that uh, they, uh, the banks get um, uh, an, an even lower rate on the package of loans designed for energy efficient renovations uh, so that they could, they could cover the administrative costs for uh, administering the small scale loans so they could, loans can scale up. Um, and at uh, the moment, the, the current Teltros are uh, duration have a duration of four years. So this uh, four years could be extended to match the um, the, the the payoff uh, that one gets from uh, from investing in, in energy efficiency and um, saving on their on their energy bills. Um, 
So what we uh, uh, there is interest from the ECB, as you can see, the executive board member Isabel Schnabel, uh, she said that uh, many banks do, do not differentiate between green uh, green cultures, uh, green loans and, and non green loans. Uh, and uh, but the ECB will actually contribute uh, to work that uh, accelerates change in uh, in um, in that regard in extending uh, green loans, uh, green cultures. Uh, so what we need is a green renovation loan standard. Um, and we know that the EBA is, is working on green loans and green mortgages definitions, and it should come up with the definitions in quarter two of 2022, uh, according to the work plan. Uh, as uh, Peter mentioned before, uh, there needs to be mortgage portfolio standards. So banks uh, obliged to report on their energy performance, uh, portfolios of uh, energy performance of their mortgage portfolios to achieve ambitious targets. And this is in the EPBD uh, uh, recast. And uh, the, loan, the, the funding that is designed for energy efficiency, uh, the public funding should be then directed into upscaling pro, uh, programs, uh, technical assistance, one-stop one one shops, including banking and, and loan officers. And uh, of course, go for the, for the most uh, vulnerable groups that are living in the worst energy performing buildings. Uh, and I would like to say a few words on the on our Anlor campaign that we want to gather public support in order to push for, for energy efficiency. Uh, but uh, this uh, this information will then be given by our colleague Vicky at the end of uh, of, uh, of, of our event. Thank you. Thank you, Ure. Um, I have some questions for you, but of course we'll get them in the Q&A in a, in a short while. Um, a reminder to everyone at home, you can ask your questions as well. I see that a few of you have done them already. Some of them have already been answered by Peter in the chat. Uh, keep them coming, of course. Um, we're gonna move on now to the second part of our event. Uh, three more speakers for you in more of a panel format now. Uh, I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, Carlos Goldstein from the European Commission. Uh, he is an advisor to Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson, uh, Energy Commissioner, of course. Uh, he specializes in the energy performance of buildings, energy efficiency, uh, everything else that is uh, more than relevant to today's event. So welcome, yeah. Carlos. Uh, then we have uh, Sean Kelly, a member of the European Parliament, uh, who is heavily involved with the review of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, so he can give us a little insight in how to how that uh, process is going. Welcome to you, Sean. Uh, and then we have Jennifer Johnson uh, from the European Mortgage Federation, who I think can help us tie all of this together uh, and really see how this can apply in the real world, shall we say. Um, each of you are going to have five, six minutes or so to give us your little take on the, the issue of today's event. Uh, and we're going to start with Sean. I oh, know we're going to start with Carlos first. I apologize, Carlos, uh, and then Sean, and then Jennifer, and then we'll launch into the Q&A. Uh, so over to you first, Carlos. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, I hope I'm both seen and heard rather well. Um, yes, all good. That's good. So Brussels broadband does serve us uh, this time around. <laughs> So I think that the setting the scene is, is uh, quite useful already. Uh, we know that uh, there's a very big challenge. This is both uh, illustrated by the, the opening uh, by Adrian, but also uh, in the introductions by Peter and Uri, uh, because uh, the, the scope of the buildings that need to be upgraded uh, is big. Um, the, the difficulty there is, of course, its diversity. Uh, it's not a single project. It's uh, more like uh, 200 million uh, separate projects. And this is why I would maybe bring in the, the notion of aggregation. Uh, really interesting uh, and important for us because uh, if we look at financing projects from an institutional perspective, uh, we uh, find that the um, let's say non-homogeneous project pipelines for individual projects are difficult to finance. Uh, that is because they might have different depths, different focuses, different financing needs. Uh, and therefore, uh, a ready-made project is hard to find that would meet 100% of each renovation's uh, needs. So we need to simplify a little bit. 
Uh, and uh, there are uh, cases out there with uh, successful aggregation. Usually this is mediated or helped by the, uh, the public sector uh, who uh, then takes uh, part of the, the role in bringing together the know-how uh, about project planning, but also about the finance uh, and about uh, and about the materials and actually works uh, being done on the ground. Uh, some uh, of you may have already heard that there is also interest from the private side to set up uh, such uh, knowledge centers or one-stop shops. Um, but we were yet to see their large-scale success in Europe. Uh, but I'm very positive and hope that we will, because in the end, the role of the European Union is not to crowd out uh, public initi uh, private initiatives, sorry, or to crowd out uh, where uh, people see a good case for optimizing cost. It's really to get the market going. <clears throat> and we saw a presentation of uh, various instruments that could be useful uh, for renovation. Uh, the loans obviously are the next step to go uh, as compared to direct grants, if we look at it from the public financing perspective. Uh, that is because um, with the loans, first of all, uh, we can make the uh, each public euro last a bit longer. Uh, that's first, the leverage effect. Secondly, uh, we should do it across the board, of course, but in case of loans, uh, there's also the case of uh, a longer time period, so you can assess the actual energy uh, savings achieved. Um, now, if we put that together, then uh, we are supporting with the EU instruments uh, quite a broad interpretation of what a one-stop shop should or could represent. Um, and it will be interesting for us at our level to now interact with the member states, uh, the next round of the uh, national uh, building renovation plans that they will hopefully submit us uh, in the context of the EPVD, uh, how they intend to use the various public funding sources. Here again, uh, getting private funds on board is, is very important. And I think that's really the note uh, how much public funds is needed in order to stimulate uh, private investment. Um, and uh, <laughs> Peter and Yuri had some good examples or good indications about what we should uh, keep in mind. So I will uh, wrap up here and hand back over to you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Carlos. Uh I'm sure that we'll have some questions for you in just a few minutes or so when we get to the Q&A. Um, we're just going to go straight to Sean, Sean Kelly from the European Parliament here. Uh, Sean, uh, give us your take on uh, today's issue of the event uh, and how it all fits into the EPPD and, and other legislative initiatives that you're working on at the moment. Over to you. Yes, indeed. And thank you very much. And well done to Adrian, Peter and Yuri, who gave us some fine detail there on some of the opportunities and challenges we have, especially in the financial area of the EPPD. And Carlos, of course, went into detail on the aggregation. Firstly, let me say, if we are to reduce our dependency on Russian energy and fossil fuels more broadly, we must address the building sector much more readily and give it the priority it deserves. The residential sector alone accounts for 40% of EU gas demand, mainly for heating and cooling. Reducing residential energy consumption would greatly reduce the need to increase the use energy generation capacity, especially for peak hours. Less pressure at peak times allows better grid balancing and accentuates the effectiveness of demand side flexibility measures. DPPD should concentrate on mainstreaming stage renovation, providing a range of tailored and cost effective solutions that will make most buildings more efficient. However, Deep renovations provide the most holistic and immediate return, and they should be incentivized wherever possible. In completing renovations, technical barriers are linked to the lack of reliable assessment methods to define the depth of the envelope improvements. Social barriers exist in the lack of adequate information tools designed for consumers to easily understand what their next step should be. 
Finally, and most relevant to today's discussion, you have the economic barriers. These are due to the lack of integrated financial services to address upfront costs, combined with support of one-stop shops. The lack of engagement of mortgage lenders and availability of low-cost loans are also key barriers. The Energy Performance of Buildings Directive under Article 15 expands the toolbox for member states in relation to financial incentives and market barriers, including energy efficiency loans and mortgages for building renovations, and by introducing the idea of a mortgage portfolio standard. The EPPD rightly details a timeline of minimum energy performance standards. In fact, I believe they should extend further to provide a clearer view for investments. However, in a time of increasing cost of living and difficulties in supply of housing in many member states, we should not impose stiff obligations without the means to achieve them. This is not just a carrot and stick matter, but a capacity matter. Currently, 72% of innovations are self-funded, yet only 18% of consumers are taking loans to renovate their homes, as they are too expensive. This is compounded by the complexity of navigating the subsidy schemes and seeking te technical expertise. Those barriers are even bigger for deep innovation projects. As has been mentioned earlier, there is a funding gap of 275 billion a year for green financing for residential buildings. These numbers do not seem to add up to the successful harnessing of renovation wave. And as has been said before, this will require a greater input from bank loans. In this sense, I see the need to establish firmer links between the financial sector and the renovation sector. I agree that bank lending is an appropriate channel to respond to the financing innovations. They are very elastic and decentralized via the extensive network of commercial retail banks. The Green Deal is economically an economic transform transformation and will require an essential enormous amount of financing, both from the public and private sector. Ensuring there is more elastic supply of affordable finance will allow governments to direct their focus more on those who need it. There are several innovative financial mechanisms and loans that could be deployed to incentivize borrowing, but the provision of affordable long-term funding should be at the core. The menu of options should be discussed with the EU, European Central Bank and the European Investment Bank with the distinct challenges of renovation wave in mind. Buildings are long-term put reliable investments. Therefore, we need to ensure a sustainable business model for banks in providing for energy efficient loans. And currently, this is not necessarily the case. Finally, the timeline for the PPD will be considering the draft report in June. The deadline for tabling amendments is July the 5th. We'll be voting at committee level on October the 26th. And the voting plenary will be the December plenary. So it's going to all happen pretty quickly. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I hope that you'll be sticking around for the Q&A that we'll be get to shortly. Uh, we're going to turn to Jennifer Johnson now from the European Mortgage Federation, uh, who I think can give us some insight into how all of this would uh, apply basically in the real world, shall we say. Uh, Jennifer, over to you, and then we will get into the Q&A. Thank you, Sam, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you um, this morning. Um, I think one of the buzzwords we've heard today um, has been mobilization and, of course, specifically mobilization of the banking sector to support the climate transition. And so I, what I'd like to do over the next six or seven minutes is just to sketch a little bit um, the efforts of us as the European Mortgage Federation since 2015 to mobilize the mortgage industry specifically. Now, Sean just mentioned the lack of engagement of the mortgage industry. You can imagine that that's something that I'd love to respond to. So I'd really like to show how um, show the progress that we've made under the Energy Efficient Mortgages Initiative, what we're currently working on, and where the remaining challenges are. And this will bring me to the Energy Performance Buildings Directive specifically. So, um, as I said, we've been working on our Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative since 2015. And for want of a better analogy, to make an omelette, of course, you have to break eggs. And there have been, and there remain a number of challenges, obstacles to scaling up 
mortgage finance um, to support the renovation wave. So we've spent um, the last seven years um, supported by rounds of EU funding, essentially seeking to address as many of these um, obstacles, challenges as possible um, within our control, of course, um, across all relevant elements of the energy efficient mortgage value chain. So I'm talking about solutions focused on retail, marketing considerations, the customer journey, risk management, IT and data related issues, partnerships with other stakeholders, the involvement of technical experts, funding considerations, and investor relations. So really that the whole value chain. And the result of this has been a vast array of research and tools to support market development. Um, and to date, I, I, to give you again a few examples, to date there has been um, extensive consumer and market research across eight markets, including most recently behavioral research, um, a data infrastructure, including um, an energy efficient mortgage label, which we launched last year and which is currently labeling 53 energy efficient mortgage products across 14 member states. The number is growing all the time. We've conducted um, research into compliance with the GDPR um, from the perspective of data collection, processing and disclosure. We've looked into the impact of building energy performance on credit risk and therefore risk management and capital requirements. And we're also um, seeking to coordinate our private sector efforts with institutional efforts to basically maximize the synergies between the private and the public sectors. Um, so this is to give you a sense of what, it, what we have been doing to engage the, the mortgage industry over the last seven years. Our latest endeavors are focused on combining all of this knowledge, all of this research, all of these tools in an energy efficient mortgage ecosystem, which will leverage on digital innovation and bring together all of the relevant stakeholders, lenders, investors, SMEs, building experts, utilities, but fundamentally with the, with the customer at its heart. And we believe this is really the way to stimulate and sustain consumer demand, which remains a challenge in all of this. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I wanted to highlight one of the remaining key challenges, which is particularly relevant for our discussions this morning. Um, and particularly relevant when we talk about the EPBD, and that is access to data and specifically access to EPC data, which is widely held by our industry um, as holding the key, if you like, to unlocking the private finance um, or private finance in support of the renovation wave. Um, first, and more, first and foremost, I think it's worth highlighting that better quality, more comparable and publicly accessible EPCs are fundamental for banks in the context of their retail and funding activities, but also in order to meet their supervisory disclosure requirements um, and commitments. We therefore believe that many of the proposed actions in the EPBD um, recast with regard to EPCs um, are very, very positive. However, in many jurisdictions, national legislation is currently preventing, still currently preventing open access to existing EPC registers due to different um, interpretations of the GDPR. And this is very problematic um, against a background where the EPC, for example, is a key measure of energy performance in the EU taxonomy, which in turn is the benchmark for a wide variety of disclosure requirements, including, for example, the green asset ratio. And for those who are not familiar with that, um, it's basically a measure of um, banks' green assets against their total assets. And this will be an extremely important indicator for, for market participants. Now, when we're devising ways, banks are devising ways to manage this by creating proxies, for example, to assign EPC ratings to their existing mortgage portfolios. But this is not only time consuming and very expensive, but it, most importantly, the results are inaccurate. So there's a fundamental failure here, let's say, in our value chain. Now, we recognize the efforts of the European Commission in this area. Um, through the EPBD, but we are concerned that the latitude which is still left to member states will result in access being limited to EPC um, databases. Um, just to give you one very quick example, we, the Netherlands has one of the most transparent and accessible um, EPC registers, but anecdotally we're hearing that there are um, potentially plans to revert, to reverse that actually and to, to, to limit access to these databases. So you see that the general direction of travel is not towards apparently greater access, which is of course problematic for the reasons I mentioned. So 
Together with a law firm, we have devised what we consider to be relatively light touch amendments to certain articles in the EPBD recast. Um, and we believe that these balance the needs of the financial industry um, with the protection of the rights of the data subjects. And of course, that's absolutely fundamental. So we started to share these amendments. And of course, we will continue to do so um, throughout the course of the, the negotiations on the EPBD. My final word here, and then I'll hand back to you, Sam, is of course, we're aware of other very important and relevant elements of the EPBD um, for energy efficient mortgages. I'm talking about the, min the minimum energy performance standards. We've been analyzing these, analyzing the potential impacts on these from a financial um, and borrower perspective, and what would be needed, for example, to mitigate the risk of stranded assets that is perhaps inherent to a certain extent to these kinds of standards. We're also, of course, more than aware of the proposed mortgage portfolio standards. We've heard those mentioned today. We have, I would say, certain question marks or reservations around how appropriate it is to hardwire a mechanism of, firstly, how appropriate a mechanism of this kind is for mortgages, but also how appropriate it is to hardwire um, a mechanism like this into legislation um, where lenders themselves cannot unilaterally improve the energy efficiency, of, energy efficiency of the buildings which are collateral for the mortgages in their portfolios. But I will leave it here for the time being, Sam. I, I'm aware that we'd like to leave as much time as possible for questions, but um, thank you again and happy to respond to any of these points. Fantastic, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, uh, I think we'll go straight into our Q&A here, just to, to bring all of our panelists back in now. Um, if any of you want to respond to any of the points anyone else is making, just use the raise your hand function, I'll give you the floor and we can maybe get a little bit of a conversation going. Um, I'd like to commend, first of all, Carlos and uh, Peter and others for already answering a lot of the questions in the chat. That gives me more time to ask questions. Great. Um, I just want to start with Adrian, first of all, because you made a point that is probably uh, the most immediate thing at the moment, which which is the Repower EU Action Plan, which hopefully is coming out uh, on the 18th of May next week. Um, do you really see this as, as a, a sort of um, milestone, really a real opportunity to get all of these issues finally catalyze something? You know, this is your shop window to really for the European Commission to propose something where the renovation wave can actually turn into this tidal wave that it needs to be, because at the moment it just seems like this trickle of um, you know, funding and proposals and different frameworks and things without anything really um, happening. So do you see next week as a, a big deal? I do. I think next week might be a watershed moment. And um, I, I was very impressed yesterday in, in our own seminar when Brian Motherway said, a gardener's view is the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. And the second best time to plant a tree is today. Uh, so finally, it looks like the politicians have uh, real and policymakers have realized uh, because of a tragic and terrible events that what some of us stakeholders have been saying uh, for seven to 10 years really ought to have been treated uh, at that time. But look, it's better to get on with it and do it now. So yes, the Repower EU Action Plan is a huge opportunity for energy renovation and for energy efficiency measures uh, it, it, overall. And uh, remember that the definition of good energy efficiency measures are those that end up reducing energy consumption. Uh, and that's uh, really got to be the focus, I think, uh, next week uh, with the Action Plan. And we recognize that when the Action Plan comes out, there will be many short-term measures but those are going to be designed or must be designed so they do not undermine medium and long-term measures that are needed to achieve our longer-term uh, goals uh, around energy and climate. And for us, that's the trick uh, moving forward, uh, that that design of the action plan must be properly calibrated so that those early actions that are going to be needed in the next six to 12 months are immediately followed up by medium term actions taking place in 12 to 24 months, and then immediately followed uh, by uh, actions that then run on into the long term. And it's that kind of calibration that's going to be needed. And as I said in my presentation, we understand that there are three pillars uh, to the action plan coming out. One on diversifying energy supplies uh, and types of energy. Uh, to boosting renewable energy, and we understand that the renewable energy target is going to even be uh, proposed to be increased, uh, even though the negotiations on the directive are underway. 
and uh, energy efficiency must also get a similar level of attention. And I suppose this is a good forum to say the building sector can deliver on short, medium and long term measures. And uh, this should be, we hope, recognized fully uh, next week in a balanced uh, approach from the, the, the Commission. So in a nutshell, Sam, I, I think that's what I would like to say at this point. I mean, I turn to you, Peter, because I, I believe in your presentation, you, you sort of mentioned that um, this action plan window could be where this idea for an EU renovation loan could be inserted and kicked off that way. Um, maybe you could just speak a bit more to that. And maybe if the Commission, unfortunately, does end up missing a trick in that regard, where the next opportunity to put this plan into action could actually come from. Of course. I mean, the, the beauty of the EU renovation loan is it's a new financial instrument and it doesn't actually require, um, you know, a regulatory basis in the same way that a, a, an energy efficiency target or other things do. I mean, I think for, from my perspective, what the um, energy savings plan, I'm sure the energy savings plan will think about how we upscale and mobilize more finance and investment into um, buildings renovation, because that is one of the fundamental things that will um, accelerate um, our ability to not purchase any further fossil fuels from, um, from Russia and will provide to those fragile, um, vulnerable communities the opportunity to upgrade their homes that they own. Now, a number of people in the chat have been asking me questions about whether the EU renovation loan fits for every single uh, possible um, uh, family and, and situation. It doesn't, of course, it doesn't. Um, and yet, I always counter that by saying, we need 35 million, and we need people who can afford these things. So uh, the energy, uh, the EU renovation loan is designed for a segment of the market, not all the market. And the segment of the market, I think, begins just above the energy poor. So you've got the energy poor and the people in rented companies in fragile jobs who will need grants. And there are a lot of grants to deal with the people in just in that space. But then, of course, there are, there are tens of millions of people who own a home, who have jobs or who are elderly and have pensions, um, but can't get access to appropriate financing today. And if you look at the financing markets, what you can see today is renovation loans relatively expensive for seven years for all various types of reasons. So this uh, instrument, I think, fits a space which is very needy. Um, and that is the tens of millions of people who own a home and who can borrow against it, but don't want to unlock equity through traditional equity release schemes, which tend to come at quite severe uh, penalties. So it's really an opportunity uh, for us to accelerate renov renovation without damaging either sort of affordability sort of characteristics or uh, other markets which are, which are being potentially well served, such as, you know, extremely wealthy people who don't need the money who, you know, who can go and borrow expensively and, up and upgrade their homes who need to as well. So, um, you know, I think um, one of the uh, sort of key areas to develop here is an opportunity in, in, the e, in the EU savings plan to just uh, identify the fact that most homeowners across Europe live in a home they own. And those people may not have sufficient income and or savings to renovate it, because as we've discussed in the chat as well, renovation is expensive. It's the most it's the most important thing you're going to spend. It's the same cost as a car for a family. I mean, I mean, so uh, we need to find a way to unlock that amount of money to make sure it gets put into the building in a high quality manner. So, of course, I believe that and, you know, having a standardized European instrument also unlocks a series of European standards for renovation. So that will ensure that people get the renovation that they that they want, not from a cowboy builder, from from a trust marked uh, um, a project manager like they have in Germany, um, for example, and other countries. And it will deliver the energy savings um, that those families need in order to make their daily lives more affordable, um, uh, because the zero coupon structure means they will pay, pay that back at the end. So I think all of those features are something that is so far untried. And it's funny, the number of conferences that I attend where people are desperate for new ideas. Well, here is a new idea. Uh, it's not out in the market yet. Um, it's something that I think that is, is an opportunity. And I actually don't, I'm not even asking for it to be launched per se. I'm asking for a hook 
for it to be developed because I, for, you know, the number of financial institutions that I talk to who are interested in considering this, the number of conversations I'm sure Positive Money would like to have with the ECB on this, and the number of member state governments who would love to know that there existed a new EU-backed instrument that would help deal with this problem, I think is large. So that's the space, you know, that's the policy and discussion space that I think we're in. And I just encourage those of you listening and those of you sort of who are keen to understand more about this to become involved. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe this is a good opportunity to bring Carlos back in. Carlos, uh, this uh, plan from the Commission is supposed to come out next week. Um, is there space for these kind of ideas in this action plan? Uh, how do you sort of rate these ideas that you've heard over the last uh, 20, 30 minutes or so? Sure, I think that there is pure gold in saying that the short-term measures need to pave the way for medium and long-term measures. And that is very clearly what we want to aim right now. So. Uh, we are at a fork in a way because uh, the disruption of energy imports from Russia leads us into a situation where we really need to reassess how will we uh, provide the energy, uh, majority of which is consumed in buildings and majority of which is uh, used for heating. Uh, how do we pr produce that? Um, and of course, it's a very clear incentive in the uh, long and medium term to take up energy efficiency because of the obvious increase in prices that the business case for uh, efficiency has improved. Secondly, to uh, integrate renewables, because we see that uh, if we rely on locally produced uh, energy and, and technologies, then we might be better off uh, in the long term as well. So there are two very clear signals uh, to uh, support what we have been doing already for a, a longer period of time in the European Green Deal. Now, uh, specifically the Repower EU communication, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a more uh, let's say visionary plan or a visionary document with some specific uh, suggestions as well. Uh, but the main focus of action, and things are still dynamic, so I cannot uncover uh, the entire detail, is about uh, looking at uh, what can be achieved by 2027. So not just the Commission saying that uh, we churn our, our legislative windmills in a certain, at a certain speed with a certain result, but actually doing something on the ground. And I think that sort of sets the scene for a lot of the, the framing. So the rest of co uh, is context, it's very valuable, uh, but let's not forget that we still also have the uh, Fit for 55 package negotiations. These are linked, but if we look sort of in a slightly longer period beyond 2027, that's where the Fit for 55 uh, package is still most relevant, is most pertinent. And of course, uh, Sean, who, who's working on uh, on many fronts, but uh, including on the PVD, uh, he will know the best and and set our scene uh, moving towards uh, twenty thirty. And moving over to you now, Uri. I mean, in your presentation, you you told us again about how um, Teltro's, you know, there are trillions of euros at stake here. Uh, I can't help but think about how member states were arguing over a few billion here or there for the recovery fund. I think that's a good sort of uh, comparison to sometimes make. Um, maybe you can tell us about how the ECB has considered uh, this proposal so far and how does it fit in with its climate roadmap? Um, how are things proceeding? Uh, yes, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, in fact, I think we need to mention here that the, the last uh, uh, operation total operations were conducted in, in last uh, December, and there hasn't been any Teltro, new Teltros announced. And uh, the ECB signaled that the Teltro, the attractive rates on Teltros will end in June this year. Uh, but we do argue that, in fact, uh, the targeted was missing from the targeted refinancing operations. And now it is time to, to truly target for greener innovations because of two reasons that are very relevant for the ECB. One is, the, is their primary mandate of price stability. If energy is exerting so much influence on price stability, uh, it's, of course, in, their, in the mandate of the ECB to, 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 uh, to do something about this. And the second one is is the, 
as the guardian of, uh, of financial stability, Jennifer Johnson mentioned the um, stranded assets debate in the banking sector, uh, but also in the kind of medium to long term going forward, as, as Carlos mentioned, um, households with uh, more and more kind of exertion and their purchasing power eroding because of fossil uh, fossil inflation uh, will have to face then what whether they'll pay their energy bill or mortgage bill, and if they do, uh, do not pay the mortgage bill, that means there's going to be a lot of uh, non-performing loans on the, on the bank uh, balance sheet. So it is in, in, in fact in the interest of the banks of the ECB from both primary and the secondary uh, uh, mandates to, uh, to target these loans and start these uh, operations as, as soon as possible. Uh, turning to you, Sean, um, I, I know that you wrote to ECB President Christine Lagarde not so long ago, you know, urging her institution to um, be more involved with these kind of issues. Um, have you heard anything back about that? Do you intend to follow it up? What's your next step in, in that kind of process? Oh, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, yes. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, and I think there is a more urgent need now to follow up than ever before especially because of the war in Ukraine and repower EU, when you consider that 40% of gas is used for heating and cooling. This is a powerful incentive to motivate people who would like to see uh, Ukraine winning the war and reducing our dependency on uh, Russian fossil fuels and uh, paying them up to a billion a day for them that everybody can actually contribute. So when you add that to the savings people can make by renovating their homes, the contribution they can make to climate mitigation and reducing emissions, and then of course, the Russian situation. The ECB and the EIB have a powerful incentive there to make it uh, absolutely easy for people to renovate their homes. And as we saw there, uh, the majority of homes that are being renovated at the moment are being done through savings. In other words, mm -hmm. people are not taking out loans for one reason or another. So the ECB, and I hope to meet uh, them shortly, need to come up with ways by which banks at national level can be incentivized and indeed maybe compelled to have a, a good portfolio of loans available that people can say, yeah, that makes sense. That's something I could do. And uh, as been pointed out earlier, where they could actually pay it back at the end of the loan rather than the beginning. So with all those incentives there and those opportunities, now is the time to move and move quickly. And that's something I'd certainly be encouraging my colleagues who are uh, dealing with the EPPD to bring into our proposals as we move along over the next couple of months. Thanks, Sean. I'll turn to you, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to, uh, the point you made about the GDPR, by the way, is a very interesting one, because um, I think that's maybe something that policymakers, lawmakers, journalists, uh, just simply wouldn't think about when uh, writing about renovations uh, and green uh, 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 policies. Um, I mean, my question to you is, um, say all of these um, great ideas are implemented down the line, the regulations are put into law, is there enough know-how in the banking sector for the people who actually work there to to handle these kind of instruments these new these new policies and if not what would you need to um, give them that know-how more money for training time um, maybe you could you could speak to that yeah it's a great question sam and i think this is really very much at the heart of our plans to deploy an ecosystem for energy efficient mortgages specifically um where you know the roles the responsibilities are clearly defined, but it's integrated. Everybody does what they're good at and everybody is connected. And as I said, the consumer is at the heart um, and we leverage on digital innovation um, so that you know suddenly overnight bank advisors yeah. are not expected, yeah. they're not expected yeah. to be energy advisors and, yeah. and vice versa. So you know everybody plays to their strengths. So what we're trying to do at the moment is we're kind of piloting an, an ecosystem in Italy. Um, we have a network of energy efficient mortgage national hubs, and we are just trying to kind of connect all of the dots, basically, Sam, to, to answer these kinds of questions. You know, where do technical experts fit in? Um, what kind of partnerships can we 
can we um, facilitate? Um, we're looking at, you know, kind of one stop shop idea where a person and, you know, a homeowner can go to a platform, a website, they can using a, a simulator understand what renovations make sense for their property, how much they'll cost, how much they'll save in energy and and um, and in money, um, what kind of funding or financing opportunities are available to them. And what you know, from a, an accredited list of installers, who is the best person to deliver this work for them and, and to realize their project. So this is, I think, our approach to that particular, let's say, conundrum, which is, you know, how do we deliver this in an integrated way? And our, so in a nutshell, an ecosystem of the right factors, the right kind of roles, the right processes and products. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about turning the banks themselves into one-stop shops, but the kind of having them as a, like a hybrid yeah. forum. Exactly. As one of the actors in this kind of broader ecosystem, but which is integrated, coordinated, where you can leverage, you know, off of everybody's kind of skills and, and um, mm. you know, and roles, essentially. Fantastic. Unfortunately, as is always the case with interesting discussions, we've run out of time somewhat because uh, I'm keen to give the floor to um, Positive Money Europe to Deputy Executive Director uh, Vicky van Eyck, who is going to talk us through more about the Unlock campaign that is being launched. Uh, Vicky, I'm going to hand over to you and then uh, we'll do some uh, rounding up afterwards. Over to you. Great. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, everything looks very, good. Very good. So thank you everyone for attending and for bearing with me for a couple of more minutes um, while I give you the, the short pitch on the Unlock campaign. Um, and I'm gonna share just a couple of slides because I do think that a visual is, is worth a thousand words. Uh, so the Unlock campaign, it really builds essentially on Positive Money Europe's long-term work over the last two years on the ECB's lending operation to commercial banks by essentially adding a condition that commercial banks should only be able to access these cheap loans from the ECB on the condition that they themselves provide cheap loans, affordable loans for green activities. And in the case of the Unlock campaign, we are talking about deep renovations of homes for individuals. Just a sec there. Uh, so the, the, the overall campaign vision is that an EU level, we adopt a policy framework that unlocks massive public and private funding to enable people to renovate their homes at an affordable cost, but also to power their homes with clean energy. So the, the Unlock campaign is, is essentially an advocacy campaign to get this EU policy framework adopted at an EU level and at a national level. But it's, it's also more than that. It's, it's a public facing campaign that on the one hand wants to raise awareness, uh, something that Adrian managed, uh, mentioned as well, to raise awareness really about the benefits of energy efficient buildings and not only for homeowners, but essentially for anyone concerned by the current energy crisis, the mounting energy bills, climate activists. So there's a really, really broad audience to raise awareness with and, and people are becoming more and more aware about the subject. So this is kind of one of the aims of the Unlock campaign, but we want to go beyond just raising awareness, of course, and we want to get the citizens in, in key countries mobilized to put pressure on, on, on their governments to really ensure that investments are made in the labor force, that there are grants in place for these deep renovations, and that there are administrative processes that run efficiently to actually carry out these deep renovations. And on the other hand, we want to show that there is um, a demand for affordable lending solutions uh, for com from commercial banks, which we at Positive Money Europe think should be subsidized by the European Central Bank, by the national central banks. So more concretely, uh, we're running a petition campaign in key member states, starting with uh, France and Spain, but also with uh, Italy and Germany and hopefully Slovakia to follow. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, and I think Peter and uh, Jennifer also reiterated, in order for the renovation wave to be a success, we need massive mobilization, not only at different levels, EU and national, but also across the various sectors. And for, for this reason, we're also working on coalition buildings in, in each country that we launched the petition, a coalition of stakeholders from the various sectors that are concerned. So renovation, actor, uh, renovation experts, climate Climate, uh, age, uh, climate organizations, alternative finance organizations, consumers organizations, just anyone who's, who's, who's concerned with, with this topic in order to, to carry out the campaign. 
So the objective is to 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 get at least fifty thousand signatures. That was our first humble objective, but we see we see the potential to to really multiply this because we're working with several petition uh, platforms who will also run the petitions in parallel. So we we do see the the opportunity to really make this a, a big mobilization across several member states, and. Uh, some good news is that the first test we ran in France in March um, got 3,000 signatures in just a month. So these are very positive figures and we will be launching in Spain and relaunching in France in the next couple of weeks uh, with the other countries to follow in the in the coming months. So I would invite you to stay tuned and sign up to our newsletter for any updates about the Unlock campaign, both at the advocacy level, but also at the mobilization and petition level. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I stuck to my five minute pitch and um, thank you for attending this call. I'll hand back to Sam. Fantastic, thank you, Vicky. I guess that all of the uh, campaign materials are available on the Positive Money Europe website. So that's where people can find it and uh, fantastic. I would, yeah, I would first yeah. invite people to sign up. There will be a little uh, box that pops up at the end of this webinar where you can sign up. There's also a link in the email that will follow. So, so by signing up to the newsletter, you will get all the campaign materials. Perfect. Everybody do that. Everyone who's been still here. Um, it's uh, time to say uh, thank you to everyone who um, took part in today's event. I think it was a really great discussion. And I think there's going to be plenty more about this because uh, the story is certainly not over, as you can see. Uh, so thank you to Jennifer, uh, Carlos, Sean, Uri, uh, Peter and Adrian uh, for your uh, wise words on this. And of course, thank you to Positive Money Europe and Renovate Europe for organizing this in the first place everyone to answer in, uh, and, and ask in their questions as well. Uh, and otherwise, uh, sign up to the newsletter, look out for more updates and um, stay abreast of all of this issue in the coming weeks and months, I think. Uh, otherwise, have a great rest of the week, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you.